Good morning, and welcome to Exploring Social Justice, a lecture series that's produced by the American by American University's Library. I'm Nancy Davenport. I'm the University Librarian, and I have the great pleasure of moderating this today with Dr. Marcia Chatelain. She is a professor of history and African American studies at Georgetown University, one of our neighbors. She's the author of multiple books, but she's going to talk about her latest book, Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, published by Live Right Publishing Company, and examines this intricate relationship among African American politicians, civil rights organizations, communities, and the fast food industry. She is an active speaker, doing most of her tours these days on Zoom, and she has won awards for major foundations who have supported her work, and we're delighted to have her with us here today. Dr. Chatelaine, would you begin? Thank you so much, and thank you to um, American University Libraries for this invitation. I think that um, I am in awe constantly of what our library systems are able to do for us, uh, especially in these trying times to allow us to continue to teach the courses that we need to teach and engage our communities. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about my new book, Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, which is now available in paperback, um, something that I'm incredibly grateful for because it has become more accessible, not only to the buying public, but um, for folks who want to assign it in classes. And I'm going to just spend some time talking about the content of the book and then I would love to engage your questions and comments about your perspectives on fast food, your um, understanding of the relationship between racial justice and food justice, and we can go from there. When you write about McDonald's, you have the pleasure of having a topic that everyone has an opinion on or an experience of. In my extensive tour of this book, I think I only met one person who said that they had never eaten at a McDonald's. And so it's interesting the ways that these familiar aspects of our culture are accessible and can provide an entryway into further conversation. So at this time, I'm going to share my screen for my um, presentation, if I could have permission to do that from the host, and we can go from there. Thank you. So. The origins of franchise are very much um, connected to my own uh, growing up as a child of the 1980s and the 1990s and someone who ate at McDonald's frequently before school, after school, and on weekends. But um, some of you remem may remember images like this. Um, in case you didn't know, this was the former president of the United States, Bill Clinton. And one of the ways that um, Bill Clinton sometimes was a target of ridicule during the 1992 election and during his presidency was this idea that um, Bill Clinton was somewhat lowbrow for an American president. And scenes like this one in which Bill Clinton could be seen stopping for a quick bite to eat at McDonald's um, became fodder for um, all sorts of uh, jokes, including his characterization by the late comedian Phil Hartman on Saturday Night Live as talking to um, voters while eating their french fries. But the reason I started with Bill Clinton was because of this curious quote that came from Toni Morrison in the 1990s. You may have heard people say that Bill Clinton was described by Morrison as the nation's first black president. And during the election of the actual first black president, Barack Obama, this quote was often referenced, but I think very few people had ever gone to the source. And that was this um, essay from the New Yorker, Talk of the Town section, where Toni Morrison was describing the impeachment trials of Bill Clinton. And one of the things that she said was that Bill Clinton was being pursued by Congress the ways that African Americans are sometimes unjustly pursued by the criminal justice system. And she said that one of the reasons why Bill Clinton was such a target, because he displayed almost every trope of blackness, single parent household, born poor, working class, saxophone playing, McDonald's and junk food loving boy from Arkansas. I always thought that this quote was very curious because we know that fast food is eaten all over the world. 
But what is it about fast food that has a particular racial register that blackness could become one of the ways that um, the association with fast food could be one of the ways that Bill Clinton's blackness could be enumerated? I always found that really curious. And so in thinking about Bill Clinton as someone who enjoyed fast food, I was really interested in the various ways that fast food means different things in different communities during different periods of American history, although fast food is known as being a kind of um, unchanging and very standardized product in the consumer marketplace. And so as I continue thinking about the role of McDonald's in the United States, images like this also came to mind. This is Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 after the killing of Michael Brown by Officer Darren Wilson and the subsequent uprising that occurred in this city outside of St. Louis, Missouri. And if you read a lot of the coverage of the nights of uprising in Ferguson, Missouri, writers were pointing to this McDonald's on Florissant Avenue as a strange kind of site of cohesion for the various actors of the drama that was unfolding in Ferguson. This McDonald's, which is franchised by an African American, is the place where a lot of the various um, issues that were animating Ferguson come together. And so reporters like um, Wesley Lari were actually arrested at this McDonald's while trying to complete stories. Officers would do shift changes in the parking lot of this McDonald's. Um, some of the people who were um, at McDonald's as patrons found themselves in the middle of the uprising after a group of protesters um, seized upon the McDonald's in order to get milk um, after they had been tear gassed. And so this McDonald's played the strange role during the uprising because it was one of the few businesses that remained open during those difficult days in August of 2014. And when I thought of this image of this McDonald's as being such a presence in this moment of racial unrest, I thought of images like this from Washington DC in 1968. This is a photograph of DC after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. where um, we know that in many cities, people also participated in confrontations with the police. There were significant property damages in property damage in many places where African-Americans lived. And as I thought about Ferguson, I realized um, how few people realize that McDonald's and Ferguson is actually the outgrowth of this particular moment in 1968 after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination and the McDonald's Corporation made a targeted effort to not only recruit African-Americans to be franchisees of their locations, but to also do targeted um, and concentrated market marketing to the African American community. When I wrote Franchise, I was very much um, informed by the uprising in Ferguson. And when I wrote the new preface for the paperback edition, I was very much um, influenced by the experiences of the George Floyd summer, where we saw incredible civil unrest, property damage, and the reaction to these various calls for racial dust, justice often pivoted around the idea of expanding business opportunities. And so I wanted to think about how these two impulses work together, not only in the fast food industry, but in a broader sense of the ways we think about how do we get to racial repair and how do we bring the marketplace into that process. And so that led me to think about the golden arches in Black America. So before we continue, there are a few things that you need to know in order to follow along the story. And one of them is the nature of a franchise. So franchises are kind of funny and I describe them in the book as the quintessential American product because it is on one hand um, suggestive that if you just follow the rules and if you play by the book, you can be a very successful business person, but you don't really own the business. What franchises are, are an agreement between a franchisor, so your Subway sandwiches, your Marriott hotels, your Dunkin' Donuts, your McDonald's, to a franchisee, a person who um, pays for the right to operate that business. 
And the reason why this relationship is so important to understand is that when you are a franchisee, you also assume the liability associated with running that business. So if a snowstorm comes into your town and you have to shut down, you absorb those losses. If there is wage theft among employees, if you need to modernize your um, restaurant to facilitate more takeout, if you have to implement um, pest control, if you have to deal with security concerns, you absorb that. And so franchising can be an incredibly risky business because they require a lot of capital in order to be successful. But many franchises are presented to everyday people as their opportunity to make it rich in business. And so of the nearly 800,000 franchise locations in the United States, franchise businesses, uh, but 250,000 of them are fast food restaurants. And so in many ways, the fast food industry has defined franchising in our consciousness about how those businesses work. But the thing that you need to understand um, to appreciate McDonald's intervention in African-American communities is that franchising is all about um, dictation of how a business is to unfold. And often it ignores the context in which businesses are operating. And we'll return to that when we talk about the book. So there are a lot of very interesting books about the evolution of McDonald's and the McDonald's brothers who founded McDonald's in 1940 in Southern California, and then later sold the business to Ray Kroc. If you've seen the film with Michael Keaton, the founder, it talks about, you know, uh, Kroc is kind of one of these evil geniuses who on one hand had a lot of uh, character flaws, but he understood business, he understood marketing, and he understood how to grow um, a cultural product like McDonald's. The McDonald's brothers um, have often been um, kind of put on the sidelines of the story of the development of McDonald's because Ray Kroc making it into a franchise sets the stage for the McDonald's that many of us encounter today. But one of the things I thought was really important for understanding the way that race operated in the development of McDonald's is to tell the story of McDonald's origins from the perspective of race and policy in the United States. So the first chapter explores the fact that McDonald's and other fast food chains are only made possible because of things like the Highway Act, which allowed for the creation of networks of transportation for the cars that would revolutionize American life. I talk about the growth of bedroom communities and all white suburbs that are able to house and fuel the economic opportunities for um, upperly mobile white families who will later go to McDonald's. And so I talk about the ways that African American exclusion is central to the various structures and forces that create McDonald's as we understand it. And so by using this lens of race and history, I was able to uncover layers to the early McDonald's stories that have essentially been either conveniently forgotten or written out of the narrative of this early business. For instance, very few people realize that McDonald's was a target of organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Congress of Racial Equality in desegregation efforts throughout the South. When we think about the big struggles to desegregate public accommodations, we often think of businesses that are no longer with us, like Woolworth's Drugs or Katz's Drugs. In fact, yesterday was the 61st anniversary of the February 1st, 1960 um, Greensboro sit-ins in which the four students from North Carolina A&T refused to relinquish their seats at a segregated lunch counter. We have these iconic moments um, in our public consciousness and in our historical understanding of the fight for desegregation. But strangely, McDonald's is not part of it. And in my research, I found that McDonald's in places like Pine Bluff, Arkansas, uh, Durham, North Carolina, Memphis, Tennessee, were places in which segregation existed. 
And that segregation was facilitated by the original design of McDonald's to be um, a place where you, um, if you walk in, you walk in momentarily to a counter, you order, you take your food and your exit. And so the practice of having colored counters and all white counters or serving white customers before black customers or refusing service to black customers entirely is also part of the McDonald's story. And this is when I started to think, how did McDonald's um, distance itself from these types of protest actions that are so central to our understanding of the civil rights movement? I think that this moment that my book explores in which it engages with black communities after King's assassination facilitated McDonald's in presenting itself as a socially progressive um, and positive force in African-American communities. And so in looking at the racial roots of the founding of McDonald's, I'm able to open up the story of civil rights and to also note about the ways that civil rights activism, particularly after major turning points, like the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, found the movement trying to decide what next. If you do yourself a favor, go to YouTube and listen to Martin Luther King Jr.'s last oration at Mason Temple the night before he was assassinated. Many of us recognize that speech because of its prophetic quality in which King declares that he has no fear of any man. He says longevity um, has, I wish to live a long life, longevity has its place but I fear no man. And he talks about seeing the promised land. I mean, it's this incredible moment in which he talks about um, his liberation from any kind of fear and his deep desire to see the movement continue. And then he is assassinated. But if you listen to the first 40 minutes of that speech, he's talking about this arc of history and he's talking about various freedom struggles and he talks about economic boycott. He talks about convening people in the Poor People's Campaign, the last campaign he was working on, but he's talking about the economic needs of the nation in order to see racial justice. And one of the things that happens as a result of King's movement thinking about economics is that it opens up the ideological space for people to say, well, Dr. King now wants us to invest in business to focus on what will be called black capitalism and entrepreneurship. But in fact, what Dr. King was talking about in the speech was the need for people to take economic um, risks, to take economic sacrifice as part of their solidarity with the poor and the working class and folks like the sanitation workers he was supporting in Memphis in 1968. And so by putting the development of the fast food industry and the various pivots of the civil rights movement together, we are able to understand what happens next. So the next chapter of the book is called Burgers in the Age of Black Capitalism. And it captures the early moments of McDonald's interaction in African-American communities. And shortly after King's assassination, uh, Roland Jones, who had been a manager in McDonald's here in Washington, DC, was dispatched to recruit the first cohort of African-American um, franchise owners. And what these black men um, had in common, and they were all men, were that they were people who were caught in this moment in America in which they were able to attain some formal education, some by way of uh, military service, others by kind of being people very much rooted in community and who had some small business experience, but were not able to access business opportunities because of racial discrimination in lending and a lack of capital. So these men were recruited first in Chicago and then later in major cities in the Midwest like Kansas City and St. Louis and then Los Angeles and later um, um, Cleveland and New York to take over McDonald's franchise locations that white franchisees no longer wanted. And in the book, I talk about the ways that many of us understand white flight as a phenomenon that occurs in housing markets. But I think it's important to understand economic white flight in terms of businesses in which business owners who are white no longer want to engage in African-American communities because of commun community scrutiny about the services and products they offer or the quality of service 
or after moments of uprising, like after King's assassination, they feel like um, doing business in these communities is unsafe. And so white franchise owners were given the option to relocate to the suburbs and in their place come this group of ambitious and very excited African-American franchise owners. And so I think about the rise of the black franchise owner within McDonald's as it related to changes in the federal government in the late 1960s, namely um, Richard Nixon's support of black capitalism. And this is the idea that um, federal government, private foundations and industry would plant the seed for black business and enterprise. Now, for those of you who know Richard Nixon, you think to yourself, huh, did Richard Nixon support black community building and was he a friend of civil rights? And I would say that the answer is no. But what Richard Nixon understood is that by providing these very limited opportunities for black business, he was able to retain some of the um, loyal black Republicans who continued to vote Republican into the 1960s. He could deflect um, criticism of his lack of support for civil rights by pointing to his business initiatives. And supporting black business within the context of hyper segregated America did not challenge any of the issues of the day, including school desegregation and equal and fair housing. So McDonald's understood that the changes in the White House could have a significant impact on their ability to keep stores in urban areas, as well as expand the Black consumer base. And so plaques like this, which I remember from my own childhood, um, were markers of this symbol of Black progress that was confined within McDonald's. And so the opening of Black franchise McDonald's in cities across the country garnered attention from both the Black and white press. People were very excited to see Black ownership unfolding during a period of time in which Black owned businesses as well as white owned businesses were fleeing some of the inner city core that had been um, the most vulnerable to the urban crisis. And this idea that um, a McDonald's could be a symbol of hope and of progress may seem strange to us today, but if you put it in the context of late 1960s America, Black ownership was so few and far between. So papers like the Chicago Defender would regularly run features on people like Herman Petty, who in, is in the center of this frame, who was the first McDonald's, um, Black McDonald's operator, um, Leonard Bennett, and then Willie Wilson, who uh, worked for McDonald's for many years and became a McDonald's supplier. Willie Wilson is a very known figure in Chicago today. He runs for president every four years and he sometimes does things like, you know, will bail everyone out of uh, Cook County Jail for the day and has become a very important fixture in Black Chicago. So the next chapter is a um, local level study of how McDonald's and Black communities um, was influential beyond what consumer purchases were happening during the time and really started to impact Black politics. <clears throat> so in chapter three, I look at the election and re-election bid of the first Black mayor of a large U.S. city, uh, Carl Stokes of Cleveland. And the story in chapter three revolves around this boycott of McDonald's in Black neighborhoods in Cleveland in the, um, in the Huff neighborhood. And the issue at hand isn't the availability of a business and it isn't the availability of service. It's about who is allowed to own a successful business in a Black community. And so an organization called organization um, Operation Black Unity creates an umbrella organization of various civil rights groups to advocate for Black franchise ownership in Cleveland. This is a rather dramatic story in the book that includes an unsolved homicide that members of the community are concerned um, are attached to an African-American man's attempt to own a franchise. There is a larger than life character who later flees to Guyana and creates a cult during the same period of time that Jim Jones uh, moves to Guyana with the People's Temple. And there is this um, African-American mayor who is trying to convince voters in Cleveland that he can be a mayor for all of Cleveland and not just Black Cleveland. 
a sentiment that will continue to resonate with African-American politicians into the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and into today. And so at the heart of this question about Cleveland and ownership is the sense that communities should be able to dictate what kind of businesses are profitable and how they interact with African-Americans. And McDonald's is very careful in this moment not to concede to the demands of Operation Black Unity because they ultimately believe that they should have control over who franchises a McDonald's and what kind of philanthropy happens within that community. And so I study the burger boycott of Cleveland as a way to understand that during these early periods in which McDonald's is trying to become a part of Black America, the question on the part of communities is, will Black America see McDonald's as a neighbor, as a colleague, or a full-fledged member? This is one of the groups that was part of Operation Black Unity. It's called, um, why am I blanking on the name of it? Um, it, was a, it was a local militant um, group that was kind of modeled after the Black Panther uh, Party for Self-Defense. And I'm sure in the middle of this conversation, I will remember the name of this group. Chapter four continues to look at local struggles with the influence of McDonald's. And this story comes from Portland, Oregon. Um, and a conflict between the local Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and McDonald's. So a white franchisee and his manager refused to support the local Black Panther Party for Self-Defense's free, free breakfast program for children. And then the party is accused of bombing that McDonald's location. And the conflict really, I think, um, encapsulates something that we can't quite imagine today. And that is local level resistance to McDonald's because of the omnipresence of McDonald's or the fact that we often associate community-based resistance to McDonald's with affluent communities that have, um, as a point of pride, declared that they've kept McDonald's out. I think it was important um, to include in this conversation uh, poor and working class Black communities that also were making arguments against McDonald's based on quality of life, active participation in the community and the deep desire to determine what kind of community resources are available. So I start with this conflict between the Black Panther Party and McDonald's. And this is a photograph um, from an FBI Portland Police Department collaboration to surveil protests outside of McDonald's. And this is Kent Ford, who is the leader of the Black Panther Party in Portland and who um, convened many breakfasts for children, who continues to be an activist in the Portland area today, who said there's no way that we had any interest in bombing McDonald's and raised questions about whether the bombing of that McDonald's was actually an attempt to destabilize and discredit the Black Panther movement. The chapter includes other vignettes from local communities like um, the Ogans Neighborhood Association in Philadelphia, that made the argument against McDonald's based on the idea that there was too many fast food in their community already, that McDonald's was bad for the environment because of the number of cars that went through the drive through as well as the problem of littering, that McDonald's exacerbated the problem of juvenile delinquency by keeping a place open late at night for um, young gang members to hang out. And they also made the argument that the city was determining um, where businesses could be zoned without consulting the community that needed resources like libraries and mental health counseling centers um, more than they needed another fast food restaurant. I also talk about the attempt on the part of African-American celebrities to undermine McDonald's success by creating competing brands that made the argument that actually we are a truly authentically black owned brand. Now, there's a little bit of um, deceit in presenting that. And if you read the book, you will see why. Um, but Muhammad Ali's Champburger was an attempt to capitalize on the deep desire to buy black and to support black communities. Mahalia Jackson's Glory Fried Chicken 
presented itself as a business opportunity that churches and community groups and foundations could create a franchise in order to reinvest in Black communities. And these businesses were putting front and center this question of what does it mean to authentically buy Black? And this question will continue to linger throughout the 70s and 80s as McDonald's presents itself as a Black-owned business when it is franchised by Black people. And so after looking at the bending of the golden arches, I wanted to make sure that I examined the cultural artifacts um, that were part of this moment in which McDonald's was pivoting toward Black consumers. And so um, I look at these ads from the 1970s. Um, one of the advocacy moves of a group of Black franchise owners who created the National Black McDonald's Operators Association was to commission the Black-owned advertising agency, Burrell Communications, to create ads like this that were relevant to Black communities. Every franchise owner contributes to an advertising fund. And Black franchise owners in the late 60s and early 1970s said that you're taking our advertising fund dollars and you're not advertising on the radio stations that play Black music. You're not advertising in our big publications or newspapers. We need to see our community reflected in advertising. And this opened up incredible opportunities, not only for African-Americans in advertising, but in market research, as well as um, creative industries like photographers and models and later television um, commercial producers. One of the arguments that I make in franchise is that McDonald's in embracing the black community and being responsive to black franchise owners because they realized that African-Americans were spending more dollars um, in these what they call black stores that they had to kind of be flexible in their support of the Martin Luther King holiday. Um, for those of you who are of a certain age, you may remember when the King holiday was first um, passed in 1983 and the reluctance on the part of states to celebrate the MLK holiday, as well as the controversies that were associated with King's legacy in the 1980s. Um, the King that we know today as a great hero of the American past, as someone who's memorialized on a statue near the Potomac, I mean, this is very new. This is a creation of the past I think two and a half decades. Um, King was very much maligned, not only in his own time, but after his death. And so the passage of the King holiday was considered a major victory on behalf of uh, many African-Americans and its advocates at the Congressional Black Caucus. But even in the kind of deliberations about the holiday, you know, people like Strom Thurmond would say in front of Credit Scott King as she's trying to get this holiday passed, you know, Frederick Douglass should get this holiday, someone who actually contributed to America. You know, Martin Luther King was a communist. He was a rabble rouser. He was, um, you know, he was unfaithful to his wife. He plagiarized parts of his dissertation. I mean, the smear campaign against King was very strong. So all of this is to say that very few corporations lined up behind the King holiday in its early days. But McDonald's, I think being very, very aware of the influence of its black consumers, as well as heeding the advice of its black franchisees were early adopters and celebrators of Dr. King's holiday. Um, McDonald's and other fast food restaurants continue to intersect with black cultural forms in their sponsorship of gospel tours. Um, this was the um, uh, All-American Double Dutch League, which later appeared on commercials for McDonald's and the All-American basketball um, tournaments were also very important in marketing black um, athletes and their influence from the perspective of McDonald's. And so these cultural, um, activities I think were really important to include to think about the ways that McDonald's again um, tries to ingratiate itself to Black communities and why sometimes these strategies worked. And so the last section of the book um, looks at the 80s and 90s and um, this chapter a uh, fair share of the pie looks at the protest strategies of African-American business people 
in the 1980s to try to expand opportunities for McDonald's. In the 1980s, a black franchisee accused McDonald's of redlining him into predominantly African-American communities. And throughout the book, I found that the language of housing discrimination was often used to describe the experiences of black franchise owners, meaning that um, there had been long held rumors that McDonald's would only let black franchise owners do business in black neighborhoods, therefore limiting their opportunities for expansion, limiting their opportunities to do business in predominantly white suburbs that tended to have lower rents, lower insurance rates, and sometimes lower security costs, and that there had been this kind of two-tiered system that um, white franchisees were able to benefit from and black franchisees were at a disadvantage. And so these groups would often contact um, organizations like the NAACP. Here um, is a march that's pictured with uh, Jesse Jackson, who was the leader or continues to be the leader of Operation Push. And in the back, if you can see at the very, very uh, to, the, to my left is um, Reverend Al Sharpton, who was the head of the National Action Network. And so I talk about the intervention of civil rights organizations that in an earlier period had been committed to racial and economic justice along the lines of education and housing and minority contracts who are now negotiating with major fast food corporations and how this contributed to some of the proliferation and the hyper concentration of franchises in African-American communities because these deals after moments of controversy like that, these fair share deals often open the door for more fast food in inner city communities in a very short period of time. And so I talk about the strategy facilitated by Black McDonald's Operators Association and other African-American organizations as creating opportunity at the very top of the economic scale and leaving behind the critical questions of workers and never fully addressing these accusations of discrimination. And finally, the last chapter looks at um, one of the narratives that got me interested in this project, and that is what I call the miracle of the golden arches. And this is a claim that was made in 1992 by then CEO Ed Renzi from McDonald's. After the uprising in Los Angeles, following the acquittal of the police officers who had beaten Rodney King, um, McDonald's issued a press release saying that its stores in South Los Angeles, where most of the uprising unfolded, were unharmed in the unrest. And that this was a reflection of McDonald's socially progressive policies that had been implemented in the late 1960s. And that McDonald's, because it had focused on African-American communities, African-Americans had protected it in the LA uprising. And when I read this claim, I was like, wow, that is a very interesting um, claim to make. But I tried to verify the claim. And so I went to the University of Southern California and I looked at the reports of the LA uprising and the various commissions. I looked at old newspapers that were talking about the LA uprising. And there really is evidence um, that goes to the contrary, that some McDonald's restaurants were targets, but they were able to repair and reopen quickly. One McDonald's um, was very close to a National Guard, um, a National Guard um, kind of staging area, and that may have protected it. But what I realized in that process is that whether this narrative was true or false was unimportant. McDonald's had been engaged in, at that time, a 25 year process of aligning itself with African-American celebrities, cultural forms, announcing itself as um, the deliverer of major economic opportunity for African-Americans. And so the claim became believable and then reproduced in a number of business articles and texts about corporate social responsibility. And finally, I think that this research on McDonald's um, really coheres with a lot of the questions um, that are being asked about fast food, um, whether it's through um, initiatives like uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative that was trying to engage families in questions about diet and exercise, or the continued struggle on the part of fast food workers for a living wage and the fight for 15, and the most recent response to McDonald's to the George Floyd summer 
in which they created a social media post saying that Black Lives Matter, affirming their um, commitment to the Black community. And at the same time, um, also uh, more than 50 former Black franchisees have sued McDonald's uh, for racial discrimination and the continued fight for um, a living wage um, galvanizes McDonald's workers to try to hold McDonald's accountable. And so in the end, at the end of the day, um, my goal with Franchise was to tell a complicated and layered story um, that is often, I think, missing when we analyze the problems of food and nutrition and diet in America. It is important for us to understand that public health interventions in um, food is critical in order to make sure that people live long and healthy lives. But if we fail to recognize the historical context that delivers certain choices to certain communities and deprives power from certain communities, then I think our interventions will often be um, uh, truncated or, um, or, or undermined by our lack of recognition of history and the complicated ways that people make choices. Um, fast food is not just about our stomachs. It's about our hearts, it's about our nostalgia, it's about our memories. And McDonald's has really effectively aligned itself with certain aspects of uh, black life and culture in a particular historical context it grew. And today we find ourselves um, confronted with the question of if we see racial justice how does economic justice um, fit into that larger puzzle? And so with that, um, I will stop my formal presentation there and I can't wait to hear your questions and your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some questions that people have put into the Q&A box that I'm going to pose to you. And then at the end, I'd like to reserve a little bit of time with you, Dr. Chatterling, to talk about the research process that you went through. Between your university being on and people from my university being on, I think the students would, this is not a typical research exercise. This was, this was something very different. And I'd like for you to talk about that a little bit to the students before we, before we close today. Absolutely. So the first question that was posed is, did Black franchisees in majority Black communities produce more revenue or more burgers, were, they, were more burgers sold for McDonald's than happened in majority white communities? And so your book is clear on that point. Yeah, so what happens um, very uh, soon after McDonald's does this experiment is that they discovered that um, the what they called black stores at the time that they were producing um, greater revenue than their suburban stores because um, their market was eating at McDonald's multiple times a day. Um, that they had a competitive advantage in some places in which there weren't a lot of other kind of quick service food places available um, and that people were really excited about uh, patronizing a black owned business. Um, but one of the things that I, I discovered um, is that McDonald's was one of the few fast food, it may have been the only of the major fast food um, chains that survived the oil crisis of the 1970s, that it didn't lose revenue and it didn't have to um, kind of lessen its growth. And the reason why is that um, the stores that were concentrated in inner city communities, um, people were more likely to walk to those stores than drive. And in suburban communities, because of the um, scarcity of fuel, families were not going to fuel up their car to drive to McDonald's. And economically, um, construction costs were higher. And so some of these abandoned or kind of run down McDonald's locations um, yielded um, higher profits. And so McDonald's knew that they had a winning formula with their inner city um, store strategy. Thank you. Um, the next one is, is there a correlation between the number of burgers sold in black owned businesses and the health disparities that those communities have also suffered from? You know, I don't know tons about volume, but this is what I do know. Um, if you saw the film uh, Super Size Me, they mm -hmm. talked about um, this kind of uh, category called super heavy users. Mm 
and in um, and, and people of color, uh, particularly African Americans, tend to um, are more likely to be super heavy users. And so I think you can see um, some relationship between um, frequency of visit and the kind of consumer base and some of the health issues. But one of the things that I think is so important to take a note is that um, there's a way that fast food and the inclusion of the fast casual category has um, done this really kind of deceptive thing in terms of public health, where we think that um, certain fast foods are healthy and certain fast foods are unhealthy, just because of the target audience for it and the aesthetic surroundings. And so it's like the Chipotle problem. Because the inside of a Chipotle is painted white and because there's um, you know chrome or stainless steel, there is an assumption that you're eating something healthy at a Chipotle. You're not eating something healthy at a Chipotle. You're eating a burrito. Um, it's the same thing around um, fast casual restaurants like Panera. Um, if you look at the nutritional content of Panera, I mean, it is high sodium, high fat foods, but because it's in muted tones, because it is associated with a more affluent um, quick service uh, restaurant consumer, then um, for a middle or upper middle class person to say, um, I let my kids eat Panera, but they never eat McDonald's is about the ways that these types of um, meanings are ascribed to different foods. The next question is, um, have the, were the owners of these first franchises, did they go on to create their own truly black owned businesses? This is a great question. So a lot of them became longtime McDonald's franchisees and then passed franchisees down to their families. Um, there's a small group of people who didn't survive. Um, so McDonald's cut a lot of breaks for, um, uh, for people of color who wanted to enter franchising who did not have the initial wealth to invest. But what happened um, was they said, well, go like find the money somewhere else. And so a lot of them became very vulnerable to loan sharks or these really kind of um, negative financial deals. Eventually McDonald's stepped in to right that wrong, but some people were unable to hold on to their stores. The recent lawsuit of black franchisees against McDonald's makes this argument that McDonald's puts, puts them in a financially precarious position where they can't expand their businesses or they eventually lose their businesses. Okay. The next question follows on from that, which is in those communities and the individuals who were the franchise owners, did they go on for other opportunities for entrepreneurship to political office? Did they use some of their funds to create cultural and community education centers or rec centers for their, for their, their communities that surrounded their stores? Absolutely. So one of the things that I think, um, was I wanted to be really clear about in the book and I don't know how successful I was, but it was this idea that like, this is not a story of like everyone's terrible or everyone's good. It's about the ways that capitalism undermines um, our best interests when we believe that the market can solve the problems of civil society. That's kind of my hot take. And so what happens is, you know, black franchise owners then and now are incredibly philanthropic they very much see themselves as an extension of King's legacy. They very much take seriously their position in the community. And I think that's the fundamental problem because when McDonald's starts to replace the critical services of the state and communities because people are poor and because they don't have um, political capital and because they don't have their basic needs met, it becomes a really hard situation for those same communities to say, well, I don't wanna support fast food or I have concern for workers' wages. How do I intersect with this community presence that has this outsized impact? And I think that this is one of the indicators of race in America. You know, when I was um, traveling with franchise and I'd give um, research talks before the book came out, some people would come up to me and say, how would you know who franchises your McDonald's? Like, that's such a strange idea. And African-Americans would say, oh my God, I know the guy who owns the franchise, you know, he gave me my first job or he paid, you know, some of my college through scholarships or I see him on the radio or I see him on television, I hear him on the radio, right? It's this kind of proximity. And I think that this is the way that racial capitalism works. It puts you into deep proximity with these various forces that are trying to close critical gaps. The next question is one where you may have prompted some future research. Um, what's the name of that larger than life character oh. you mentioned who fled? 
Um, so he, he went by several names, but um, Prophet, uh, Prophet David Hill. And um, he was, um, so he was in Guyana and he was implicated in a homicide there. And he was um, guaranteed immunity from prosecution if he came back to the United States and he came back to Ohio. And, um, you know, if you're a graduate student or a, a researcher, there's 10 dissertations to write about him and his influence in Cleveland is fascinating. Why haven't franchises like these been held accountable? Um, or why haven't they responded to the rise of obesity, dementia statistics that, that we think are derived from the food deserts and the consumption of such high caloric foods and high fat foods in the black communities? So I think that this, the fact that um, there's multiple relationships that are happening at the same time, I think McDonald's is a hard target um, for African-American civil rights organizations that not only take donations from them, but facilitate their expansion. Um, very early on, the NAACP, Operation Push, um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, you know, King's own organization, they were hosting opportunity fairs for franchises, right? Because this was considered a great opportunity in 1970. And I don't think people could have anticipated, um, you know, they didn't see around the corner and they didn't see what we see today about the impact of fast food because um, the low wage work of fast food restaurants could help support families and it could respond to some immediate needs. The problem is, is this is not a sustainable or long-term impact. Also, the Congressional Black Caucus, um, a lot of their members have gotten support from Black franchisees, as well as some of the kind of philanthropic arms of these groups. So who's going to go up against um, these very powerful organizations? And so I think the tide has changed a little bit in terms of um, uh, leaders who are not only critical of McDonald's because of health and nutrition, but because of wages. And so I think you are seeing um, some different interaction with this very powerful group. But, um, you know, in terms of accountability for nutrition, I think it's mixed because we saw that after the film Super Size Me, McDonald's, you know, got rid of fries and Happy Meals and had salads. People don't go to McDonald's for a salad, right? I think the issue that we're trying to think about is what does it mean when communities have such limited food options? Yeah. Um, we have two more and then I'm going to leave time for you to talk about your research. The next one is, um, what would you say about the historical exclusion of Black Americans in food business and in franchising? And how does that relate to the whitewashing of diet slash health culture today? Absolutely. So I think that um, a number of things happen. Um, the first one is that um, there was significant resistance to fast food during the time that I write about. And it came from a number of like, you know, people like Dick Gregory, mm -hmm. who was a very early advocate of clean diets. But you know what? Gr Dick Gregory also took the side of a major franchise owner in a dispute against Burger King. And it's not because Dick Gregory liked burgers, he did not, but it's because I think that um, there are moments of racial solidarity that supersedes some of these divisions because because people can um, relate to that uh, sense of exclusion and injustice, even when they aren't perfectly aligned. And so I think that there's some really interesting things that emerge around food. Um, there are different movements that try to kind of push back against this healthier, fast, casual food, healthier, fast food. The Nation of Islam had a, has had and continues to have in cities, um, you know, these restaurants that are supposed to be more whole diets. I think that access to capital often is the reason why these um, businesses aren't able to compete and to offer an alternative. And I think then what happens is that um, because of the limited options in some places, fast food becomes more and more racialized. I think the creation of fast casual as fast food for elites has also created um, an environment where then fast food really becomes um, the food choice of the hyper poor. Your answer to that question relates directly to the next one. And in this case, I'm going to introduce the questioner um, because he's about to become the next Dean of the School of Communications at American University. Sam Fullwood is, as, is asking this question. Were there black franchise, franchise operators in white communities? And if there were, 
did they downplay their race in order to be successful? So I interviewed a few people who are in this position and they told me, and this is allegedly, um, one of these people um, is also one of the people suing McDonald's currently, is that you would be assigned a white neighborhood as kind of an act of hazing. So in the 1980s, when he wanted to enter franchising, he was assigned a franchise in Lincoln, Nebraska. And he felt like it was given to him to test him to see if he was really committed and to see if his family would move to Lincoln and kind of go through the motions in order to do it, in order for him to later access McDonald's locations in the South. Um, yes, there are McDonald's franchisees who have been able to build their portfolio to 20 locations, 10 locations. Anecdotally, they tell me things like this. I don't let people in the suburbs know that I'm the franchisee. And I spent time with a franchise owner in a Southern state and his store in the black neighborhood, everyone knew who he was. And he said, we're gonna go to my, one of my other stores. And the manager knew who he was and he kind of sat quietly, no one recognized him. And they said, this is, the, this is what I have to do to be successful. So you start to see these different coping strategies. And the last thing I will say about um, this issue of assignment, um, back to my earlier point about how some of it mirrors the ways that we think of housing discrimination. In the late 60s and early 70s, there were claims that when a black franchise owner was assigned in a territory that was majority white, they would have death threats and they would have um, groups of white franchise owners pressure McDonald's to not assign them the stores. So you see this um, same type of um, gatekeeping and territorialism that we see in other um, spaces. Wow. Thank you very much for as answering all the audience's questions. Now talk about how you went about your research. Because as I've gone through the footnotes, the back of the book, um, <laughs> You have, you have, I think, scoured archives, interviewed incredible numbers of people, read everything that preceded you. What else? You know, the, the contribution that I've always wanted to make as a scholar is to suggest that another, another way is possible. Um, you know, my first book was about African-American girls in the Great Migration, and a lot of people had questions as to whether you can write a book with girls' voices in it um, from that period of time because of the challenges of the archive. And so when I decided to write a book about McDonald's, the first question is, well, did McDonald's open their archive to you? And they absolutely did not. Um, they have their own um, uh, curator and their, their own archivist, and they have incredible collections. It's just outsiders are not welcome. And I said, fine, I don't need your archives. <laughs> McDonald's, McDonald's is everywhere, right? But when we kind of change the frame and say, how has McDonald's appeared in black communities? The archive is endless because we have to, when I sat down and I mapped out all of the social relationships of the 60s and 70s, who was kind of setting the terms of what civil rights and what black capitalism and economics would look like during the period? I wrote all their names down. This is how I start every research. I write everyone's names down. And then I start with WorldCat. And then I start with all the places that they appear. And because if you just try to search for archives related to McDonald's, you will get some business reports. <clears throat> You'll get some material. But if you start to kind of frame it and say Southern Christian Leadership Conference and McDonald's and franchising and fast food, a whole world opens up. And the traveling that I was able to do for this project was amazing because, you know, the cover of the book, oh, I don't even have a cover, copy with me. Um, the cover of the book comes from uh, Portland, Oregon, right? There's an incredible story of Black history unfolding around McDonald's in places that are not the usual, you know, cast of characters, your Chicago's, your New York, Atlanta. Um, my favorite process was going to the University of Virginia and working in the papers of, um, uh, Julian Bond, and you know, he was such an incredible presence, and I think of him as the elder statesman of, statesman of Black America. He franchised a Dairy Queen and a Wishbone Chicken. Incredible amounts of research about franchising from Julian Bond. And so I think it was about mapping power in this period of time, and then working backwards to get the documents that can tell a cohesive story about McDonald's. And it's so hard to do business history. And it's so hard to feel like when you do business history that you're beholden to um, the sources. But I think that, um, you know, I just tried to 
um, be as open-minded as possible about where information comes from and to really just listen to the archives. And also, I mean, they're incredible librarians and archivists and, you know, special collections offices that were just so supportive, but it's understanding how things happen in Black America during this time that allowed me to really consult the sources and go to the places um, that I needed to. And I just want to acknowledge, I see some old friends have joined. Um, Janelle Cloutier, who I think I know from college, unless there's two, I think you're one of the advisors in the Honors College when I was an undergrad at the University of Missouri. Thank you for being here. I think you work at American now, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, and Lauren Johansson McCoy, there's all these people I've worked with in the past. I think it's, um, the one thing I will say about research is that um, the process of being able to share your research is so amazing. And it's something that I miss um, not being on the road anymore because you not only get to see old friends um, and make new ones, but when you talk about McDonald's in the context of this period of time, the deeply poignant and personal stories that people share are something that um, I, I think I'm proudest of. Um, one of the last events I had before the lockdown was at the Kansas City Public Library and an African-American woman uh, told the story of remembering her first date at McDonald's. And she said, you know, I grew up in the segregated South, so we never went to have ice cream because my grandmother didn't want us to like, you know, line up in front of a colored window. So we always had homemade ice cream. And I remember the first time I had McDonald's ice cream and it was so special. And I think that while I'm incredibly critical of McDonald's and some of its um, practices, I always want to take into consideration that institutions have multiple meanings and hearing those stories from people um, was always so great. And being able to, to share um, the research journey is always so wonderful. Thank you. Before we all applaud for you, I want to announce the next speaker so the people who are here can begin to sign up. Our next speaker for this social justice lecture series will be on Thursday, February the 11th at 1130. And it's Dr. Jelani Cobb. And he will talk about the half-life of freedom, race, and justice in America today. He's a writer, an author, an educator, and a leading voice in African-American history and his book, The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress is a pretty profound work um, in this era of civil rights and, and leadership. You may register for this program through the library's event page. And Dr. Sherry Williams, who's in our School of Communications is going to be the moderator for that program. Dr. Chadwin, thank you so much. On thank behalf you, of everyone. all of our audience who's here and they have stuck with us through the entire thing. Thank um, you. It's been enlightening and puts together lots of different pieces. You, you've told a story that wove things together in ways that start to make sense of previous experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the audience. We hope to see you again in another week. Bye-bye.